So today we're going to discuss Nietzsche's criticisms of capitalism, and the sources are mostly found in Human Alti Human Books 2 and 3, entitled Assorted Maxims and Opinions and Wanderer and His Shadow. For some of you, the content here may be surprising. You know, how is it that Nietzsche could write such things as to argue that we should compensate the proletariat for the abuses they've suffered, that the rich should hold themselves responsible for being on the guillotine's end of the socialist revolution, and write that wealth is also a danger? Well, we've read a lot of ancient Greek influences on Nietzsche, and in the ancient thinkers, we almost always find the same attitude towards wealth. Wealth is almost always treated as a danger. It is a danger to the unity of society and a danger to the moral character of all who hold it. The demand throughout antiquity was that only a man of the nobility ought to hold property because they were the only ones with the virtue to be wealthy, the strength not to become corrupted by it. And those who became wealthy through private enterprise were therefore inherently distrusted because the noble-spirited person has a task. They have a challenge higher than the acquisition of wealth. For him, wealth is only a means, only perhaps a way of displaying his richness and splendor of spirit, right? But with the person of the mercantile background or the successful tradesman or smallholder, there was always this suspicion that the advancement of their material position would start to become the ends. But wealth as a danger and a vice can never be the ends. And that, in fact, the ravenous hunger for more and more wealth is an indication in and of itself of a weak-willed person. And if such people are allowed into the halls of power, society will be severely threatened. We find this attitude in writers as disparate in time and in their viewpoints as, for example, Plato and Theognis. In Plato's Republic, Socrates argues that any society that allows the unrestrained acquisition of wealth will not be merely one society, but two, the rich and the poor. They will be so divergent in their interests that other powers will actually be able to inveigle them into fighting one another. And so they'll fail to achieve the unity that is needed to create the good state. The philosopher rulers and the warrior class that fights to defend the Republic. In Plato's vision, they are supposed to live above the pursuit of property for this very reason. They have to be a non-economic class of men. Plato believed this because he even saw the nobles of Sparta corrupted by wealth insofar as the Spartan driving ambition that they have, right, throws itself into the competition for wealth. And then we could look at the attitude expressed by Theogenes. He's a noble displaced by the revolutions and the ascension of a wealthy capitalist class, we could say. So, you know, his position's rather understandable. Uh, for him, the mere attainment of wealth does not make one noble, and he rails against the character, or lack thereof, of the nouveau riche of his time. He perceives that in ages past, the aristocracy was a thing sanctified by religion and defined by its character, by its ability to sacrifice and renounce pleasures. That attitude is formalized in Aristotle, who sees virtuous action as expressed in the golden mean between two extremes. He treats greed as one such extreme, the opposite extreme of laziness in, that, in the case of greed, and so the mediation of which is something like a desire for achievement or ambition. He also sees stinginess or you know miserliness being cheap as one extreme in contrast to extravagance, right? Spending ostentatiously. And so the mediating virtue between them is something like a moderate liberality, right? Um, spending when you have to and saving when you have to. And so in other words, for Aristotle, greed, the desire for wealth, and the extravagant spending that one, you know, of the wealth that you already hold, these are things that have to be moderated or else you will fall into vice, right? We might also look to the Romans. The Romans attest throughout the days of the early Republic that luxuria is a danger and that wealth has what, what's called an innervating effect on the energy of society, such that wealth in and of itself makes you soft. And that again, the only way to avoid this is to be a person of discipline and voluntarily subject yourself to hardship and challenge, which is why the Romans campaigned ceaselessly in the early days of the Republic. The Roman attitude towards wealth, I think, is particularly interesting because they always regarded it as not just a danger to the moral character of the individual, but to society as a whole. 
There's an old formulation of Cicero's that the health of the people should be the supreme law. Salus populi suprema lex esto. The meaning here is not limited to physical health, but health in the sense of the overall functionality of society, its overall moral character, what Nietzsche might call its vitality, um, but it could also be seen reflected in the unity that Plato wished for in a society, which is certainly a part of what Cicero is talking about, and this is what the North African philosopher Ibn Khaldun calls asabia, the capacity within a given society for cooperation. Your ability to get people to pay their taxes without any trouble for these, you know, grand projects of building and so on and so forth. The health of the people might also be reflected in a very real sense by what concerns the likes of Machiavelli, that, you know, we could think of it in terms of martial readiness, a society's ability when an external threat arrives to muster soldiers, the ability to fight to defend what is yours. Um, the health of the people here means the strength of a collective entity, such as a nation state, to preserve itself when a cataclysm strikes, to continue to hold its shape. And so health here doesn't, it doesn't have to do with whether the people are happy per se, and it doesn't refer to their comfort or the safety of any individual person. We might compare the situation to that of an athlete. It may make him happy to eat nothing but candy bars, but that's not what's good for him. He has to be able to play a sport, run the marathon, or whatever it is. He has to be able to compete when the time for competition comes up. And if he can't do that, he'll lose. So his fitness isn't determined by whether he's happy or whether he's comfortable. It's not a sedate sense of health, right? Uh, it has to be an active sense of health, which in truth is really the only sense of health because life is moving and active. And that this is what the state depends on for its existence. Uh, the polity has to be healthy in the sense of being able to bring a collective cooperative power to bear when problems and situations arise, right? So the argument from all the ancients then is that when luxuria becomes the only motivating force of human behavior, the health of the people in this sense is damaged. Luxuria obviously translates to luxury. We could call it wealth or we could call it the goods desired by the people, right? And what is luxuria as a motivating force other than really desire. And that's what capitalism is ultimately about, the fulfillment of human desires. Economics itself is ultimately concerned with people's attempts to acquire their wants and their needs. The central argument of capitalism in its own defense is in some sense a utilitarian one, that capitalism has done the best job of any other system at satisfying our desires. Americans in our capitalist paradise can go to Walmart at four in the morning and have a selection of 30 flavors of chips and 40 kinds of soda and every brand of frozen pizza, right? But given the nutritional profile of a lot of that high caloric American junk food I just mentioned, maybe you can see where I'm going with this, that capitalism is great at giving us what we want, but the market itself doesn't distinguish between what we want and what we need. There's only the desire, which is reflected in the price. Thus, wants and needs are in some sense leveled. They're made uh, equatable. And oftentimes choosing what you need is hard when it goes against what you want. You know, if you want to have a long, healthy life, what you need to eat is whole foods, right? Meat, vegetables, fruit, nuts, eggs. I know there's some debate about all this, but, you know, pretty much everyone would agree. Avoid as much processed stuff as possible, as little additives and preservatives and seed oils and trans fats and stuff like that. But in capitalism we're not going to make that choice for you. We let you make the choice. And the only problem is we can now see clearly a lot of people don't possess the capacity to make the correct choice, quote unquote. They don't have the willpower to overcome the pull of addictive products loaded with sugar and salt designed to be as palatable as possible. And who can blame the public at large? These are desires more powerful than anything we've ever had access to out on the savanna or on the steppe, or as the first agriculturalists, you know, in the Golden Crescent, or wherever it might have been. For the first couple hundred thousand years of human existence, right, we've never had anything like this. We've had relatively little time since modern high-caloric food started being produced, and it is so powerful in stimulating our desire for it that people can't overcome that addiction. And so many people choose what they want over what they need, more often than not, and they become unhealthy and contract a bunch of illnesses and die young. 
Now, on some level, I, I could hear the objection from like the people with the more social Darwinian points of view, like, well, some people are just irresponsible, right? Um, and they have to suffer the consequences for that. The issue here is it's not just some people, right? It's that ca- capitalism is a system of incentives like any other. And we always have to ask what it is that capitalism incentivizes. What capitalism intends to do is satisfy human desire. And it's structured such that it rewards the one who does this with the greatest capital efficiency. So we can say that capitalism selects for efficiency, here meaning speed, immediacy, convenience in terms of desire satisfaction, which upon a little closer reflection, it's often the most antithetical thing to the health of the people that you could um, incentivize for. And so perhaps the most logical thing one could do with industrial capitalism, according to its own incentives, would be to just turn as much of our productive forces as possible to the task of creating vast SOMA factories, right? SOMA is the drug from Brave New World, the use of which is encouraged by the state in order to further the complacent happiness of the populace. And when we look around, we see that in many respects, our economy already does that to a large extent. I mean, what else is a factory that bottles sugary, corn syrupy, bubbly soda, but a Soma factory, right? What else other than industrial capitalism manifest in the, the form entirely devoted to giving people treats, right? To not just satisfying desires, but often manufacturing desires. And these desires are now so powerful due to our level of technological achievement that they're designed to hack our physiology so that we can't resist. So that when we eat some sugary junk food, our brain says, wow, this is the most nutritious thing for me ever. And obviously I'm still trying to survive as a hunter gatherer on the savannah, right? So give me more of this. And the result is massive numbers of diabetes like we've never seen, right? And that's not just in America, that's happening sweeping through China right now. And so the literal health of the people is damaged, but we can see how there's a deeper problem here, right? The broader sense of society's health and what it values and what it's optimizing for and the way that Cicero is talking about, that's also damaged. That there's something wasteful about human life being devoted to the production and consumption of desires which do nothing to advance life, but only make us complacent and pacified. These incentives, when they collide with the psychology of the populace, they're not just going to pull some, but the majority of people in in their direction, right? The cumulative effect is to weaken the social order itself um, by affecting the vast majority of the populace, albeit mostly in small ways, right? This happens for a number of reasons. The person who can satisfy desires with the greatest capital efficiency, they're going to gain the greatest share of whatever market they're operating in. And in accordance with the positive feedback loop of economic success, Um, one success begets another one and one failure begets another failure. So one can quickly skyrocket to dominance in certain contexts, often from a myriad of factors that you have no control over yourself. We might think of Amazon as it was founded, right? It was just a website to sell books online. Um, But it was founded right at that sort of precipice of online shopping becoming the behemoth that it is. And so now it's the apex predator and no online seller can even remotely compete with them because they basically get to set the rules of the online market, at least to a large extent, because they own most of that market, right? So as the health of the people in both a literal sense and in an extended broader sense begins to suffer... What actually happens as we create these systems of welfare to manage an increasing number of people who are ridden with disease and disability and who become more and more dependent on the state for their very existence, the state is incentivized to do this in spite of the burden that it incurs because it sort of justifies the state's existence and its expansion. And thus we have the situation today where in some places Walmart is taking a significant amount of money out of the um government revenue of the areas they're operating in because of the amount of food stamps that their own employees are having to draw from the system in order to survive, right? So the ensuing bureaucratic expansion ends up eroding social cohesion even further, and it drives another wedge between the property holders and society and the propertyless masses, right? Perhaps more importantly, we might notice something about the kind of people whose main skill set is satisfying desire most efficiently, which we might say that's the skill set of the merchant, of the businessman, right? 
And we might look at it in terms of what we're not selecting for, for who we elevate to the top of society. We're not selecting for moral character. We're not selecting for the ability to fight or express power in the physical sense. We're not selecting for religious piety. We're not selecting for a sense of fostering a sabia, the unity of the people. We're not even really selecting for reason, although you could argue, you know, a very successful businessman is going to be probably more intelligent, right? And he's going to be good, probably at a set of technical skills, technical in the sense of specialized to the world of business. Um, but in a system by which people at large are sickened and their lives ultimately made worse and society driven apart by inequality, the people look up and they see the winners of the system who don't reflect anything extraordinary in themselves in terms of their character. And so as this process continues, the capacity for collective action begins to decline. The conflict turns inward and strife breaks out between the classes. They cease to cohere as one society with a shared destiny and begin to compete with one another more so than against other collectives, right, on the geopolitical level. So the desire for personal advancement at this point has become all-encompassing because you know, the image of the elites suggests that anyone could be one. They don't appear to be special people, at least by and large. And whereas an ancient Roman might have been willing to die for a patrician commander who was himself willing to sacrifice his life for his own men, we see the Romans became less and less willing to do so in proportion to the degree that the patricians of Rome became less concerned with self-sacrifice and virtue and more concerned with who could throw the biggest banquet. This destabilizing effect eventually ends in the revolution against the state and its overthrow. And that is usually motivated in times both ancient and modern by an eventual um, wholesale challenge to the property relationships that are defended by the state and established since time immemorial. Property itself is eventually seen as illegitimate and it's because it's not something that's bestowed on the virtuous. And we couldn't blame Nietzsche, therefore, if he didn't see anything really new in the rise of socialism in the 19th century, insofar as it was simply a repetition of the democratic uprisings in ancient Greece, which were described by Plutarch, by Aristotle, by Theognis. And just as these ancient authors all claimed, Nietzsche shares in their sentiment that the beginning of the aristocratic downfall was that loss of its spiritual and moral authority, the loss of belief in its superiority, the blurring of distinctions between noble and common. And in spite of what the communists might say, nothing can achieve this blurring of class distinctions faster than capitalism. And I would also note that I think that's actually in line with what Marx said, because capitalism is the sublation of the feudal system, right? Capitalism progressed us beyond the inevitable, like, intractable ties of blood and land, right? But it it introduced this ability for things like sudden acquisitions of wealth for people to come out of nowhere and become richer than the most prestigious uh, patrician family or, you know, allowed wealth to flow through society according to who can perform a trade that could best satisfy desire as we've been talking about. Right. And so there are very few people who'd want to go back to like aristocracies of blood these days. And I am not one of them. But every way in which we advance is always a trade-off. Um, and so we have to ask ourselves, has the selection mechanism of capitalism been any better, or is it in some ways worse? And if it is worse, then we have to think about what to sublate it with, right? To use the uh, Hegelian or Marxist term. Um, and Nietzsche doesn't agree with the socialists that the next step should be socialism or communism, but we'll get to that as we continue. Now, capitalism obviously doesn't abolish the hierarchy. Far from it. What it does, as we've laid out, is introduce a new selection mechanism for the hierarchy, which in this case is capital efficiency. And capital, in some sense, is your ability to satisfy desire. Now, if we were to contrast the selection mechanisms that acted upon like fighting aristocracies in the pre-capitalist age, we, if we were to contrast those selection mechanisms with those acting upon the capitalists, we might note several important differences. So first and foremost, the capitalist doesn't make war. Capitalism is 
war by other means, as it's often said, precisely because the various captains of industry don't marshal armies and duel each other in the streets, right? The CEO of Pepsi and Coke don't shoot at each other like mafia dons who are battling for territory during the time of like alcohol prohibition, right? And why is that? Well, because capitalism occurs within the peace created by the state, within the freedom from the state of nature granted by being brought under state power. Um, that's the only way we can even really rigorously imagine the idea of capitalism, that the market is dependent on the state in some sense, because you need the state to defend against things like fraud. You have to have a universal law or standard imposed to prevent all the businesses from defrauding one another. But if you just say, well, people will just wash themselves and we'll do it based on the honor system, or we'll let the market sort it out. If you let the market sort it out, somebody could defraud a lot of people for a lot of money and then if there's no state to step in and stop that, yeah, okay, people won't shop there anymore if they're always getting defrauded, right? But usually what happens is people just skip town, right, with all the money, um, and they just get away with it if you let the market sort it out. Because the market is sort of, the consequences that the market imposes are always delayed, right? So in any case, as our founding fathers wrote, you know, here in America, the government exists to keep the poor from murdering the rich. The republic, the state exists for the sake of the holders of capital because the poor don't need that kind of protection, right? They have nothing to steal, really, and the rich fund most of what, you know, the government is. So now, obviously, we we would regard it as an innovation that our businessmen don't act like mafia dons in 1920s Chicago. But thankfully, for the ancient Greeks, right, their aristocracies didn't fight each other in the streets either, at least when there wasn't a civil war going on. But just as the Greek revolutions played out, the Roman civil wars of the late Republic, for example, Livy tells us, these were basically caused in large part by luxuria, by the greed of the Roman aristocrats overriding their sense of duty, that the fighting aristocracies developed martial qualities because they were routinely tested in combat. And as a result, there's sort of a selection mechanism on the aristocracy, just as there was on the plebs. You know, the proletariat is always being selected upon because their daily existence is like a struggle to make ends meet. But there was a time when this was true of the nobility also, that the Roman patricians died in combat left and right. You know, as a patrician, you're expected to lead the charge into battle, that sort of thing. So not only did the nobility of the aristocratic period um, have forces pressing against um, them as a selection mechanism, it made them also heroes to the populace at large. And so the sort of low-quality people who can't hack it in battle are culled away in this process, and the unity of the upper and lower classes is sort of achieved by engaging in collective struggle with an external enemy, right? So that's how you achieve that class collaborationism that the Marxists are always so worried about. Now, what does the merchant do, on the other hand, when the enemy soldiers are at the door? Well, he flees, right? He pays other people to fight for him. In modernity, capital is this means of obtaining social influence and political influence. And we could say that the corporate leaders are at the helm of our society in many respects politically because they have more power over the direction of government than anyone else. They largely fund most of the agencies that are supposed to regulate them, which creates a conflict of interest, which makes the regulation very mild. And they pay for the campaigns of the politicians. They hire lobbyists who, by the way, in America, at least, the lobbyists actually generally are the ones who write the legislation. So they're not elected officials, they're private individuals. And then they just sort of hand it in to the whatever elected representative they bought and paid for. And so the way the capitalist elite tends to exercise power in the world, and the set of skills that produce their power, right? What are these skills? Well, they have to do with contracts, with law, with guile and trickery, with deception and the maintenance of corporate secrets, with persuasion and public relations, with you know knowing the legal contrivances in order to achieve victory through litigation, engage in lawfare, neutralize a threat through arbitration. This is the character of the successful businessman, right? These are his skills. And so in this portrait of him, we understand why the ancients all said, never let this guy be in charge. We find that the capitalist class is more or less entirely a class that thrives on dishonesty, relies on the state for its protection, 
has relatively short-term goals, at least compared to the old monarchies, right, who had their sights on what their legacy would be in a thousand years. The businessmen, however, have to keep their focus trained on the here and now. In this world, the business world, events evolve quickly, and one's eye is always trained on what is right over the horizon in order to react accordingly. You know, the, there's that famous saying of Keynes that, in the long term, we're all dead. So there's an extent to which the entire capitalist project and the enthusiasm for it depends on the capitalist constantly and immediately delivering on the satisfaction of all desire. There's an immediacy to it, and that includes the desires not just which are sold in the market, but the desires that incentivize those who do the selling, right? It includes the desire of the businessman for a higher quality of life. That's the lure which pulls him upwards in the, the ranks of his you know, bureaucratic corporate structure. And he makes more money as he climbs upward, and that means he can afford more pleasures. We are lured constantly along with pleasure, and thus the total picture is this. A capitalist society becomes a society of pleasure-seeking, and accordingly, the issues of greatest attention become those of self-preservation, medical health, the market's ability to continue functioning unimpeded at all times. We begin to optimize for the greatest convenience, you know, just-in-time delivery as like this sort of zenith of capitalist, global capitalism, right? And any interruption in that ability to seek pleasure is really damning for the system and causes mass outrage, as we saw with the supply chain crisis, right? And so then the man who rises to the top in this capitalist culture is a reflection of that culture, as we see it all around us. He is shallow, he's materialistic, he's narrow-minded, he's typically short-term, he's deceitful, treacherous, fake, and above all, hedonistic. When we look up to the top of the pyramid, we see ourselves, we see all of our own flaws. And this is truer than ever now that we have celebrity gossip magazines and tabloids, right? We know that the rich and powerful have all the same vices and desires that we do. And, you know, I would say while there are people who are idolized, we still have the term of someone being an idol. Most people don't even have heroes these days, right? And with that falling away, the entire idea of hierarchy is called into question, something which in practical terms can't actually be done away with. Every attempt to subvert the hierarchy merely rearranges it or adjusts its incentive structure. It always ends up creating a new one. And so the only choice is how to select the people who find their way to the top of the hierarchy. Are there better and worse ways? And so what is this anti-capitalist diatribe uh, that I've given you for the first 30 minutes of the episode have to do with Nietzsche, right? Some of you may be asking. Well, now we're going to get into the textual evidence um, for these positions, because this is roughly speaking Nietzsche's opinion of capitalism and what it truly is. Um, this is the critique, a non-Marxist critique of capitalism. It's a critique inspired out of classical antiquity, as Nietzsche sees it. So we'll look at those handful of passages from uh, assorted maxims and opinions, and then the water in his shadow. And uh, these kind of cover the topic of private property, um, the character of the rich, as we've been talking about, the advancement of democracy and its advancement in relation to the rise of socialism. So in the following quote from the maxims, um, Nietzsche addresses the wealthy man of today, and remember from our previous episode, Nietzsche sort of believes that the socialistic energy is building to a fever pitch in Europe, and that some kind of conflict or reconciliation, one or the other, is going to be required between these parties of the rich and the poor. And that means that the democratization and socialization of Europe is in some sense inevitable, and really the, the only questions that remain is how it's going to play out. So he speaks here to the rich, and really I think he's speaking to the super rich, and he gives them his advice in light of this. This is aphorism 304, quote, The revolution spirit and the possession spirit, the only remedy against socialism that still lies in your power is to avoid provoking socialism. In other words, to live in moderation and contentment, to prevent as far as possible all lavish display, and to aid the state as far as possible in its taxing of all superfluities and luxuries. You do not like this remedy? 
Then, you rich bourgeois who call yourselves liberals, confess that it is your own inclination that you find so terrible and menacing in socialists, but allow to prevail in yourselves as unavoidable, as if with you it were something different. As you are constituted, if you had not your fortune and the cares of maintaining it, this bent of yours would make socialists of you. Possession alone differentiates you from them. If you wish to conquer the assailants of your prosperity, you must first conquer yourselves. And if that prosperity only meant well-being, it would not be so external and provocative of envy. It would be more generous, more benevolent, more compensatory, more helpful. But the spurious histrionic elements in your pleasures, which lie more in the feeling of contrast, because others have them not and feel envious, than in feelings of realized and heightened power, your houses, dresses, carriages, shops, and the demands of your palates and your tables, your noisy operatic and musical enthusiasm, lastly your women, formed and fashioned but of base metal, gilded but without the ring of gold, chosen by you for show and considering themselves meant for show, these are the things that spread the poison of that national disease, which seizes the masses ever more and more as a socialistic heartage, but has its origin and breeding place in you. Who shall now arrest this epidemic? End quote. So who is to blame for socialism? The rich are. And not simply by the fact of their being rich, but by the fact of their being unvirtuous. The socialistic heart itch has its origin in its breeding place in the rich. What does that mean? It means that the extravagant habits, the ostentatious spending of the rich, their obvious hedonism, all of these things combine to form an outward image of them which indicates a relatively low-quality person. It's been said about Americans that... We are all temporarily embarrassed millionaires. We're all convinced that we could be rich if only Lady Luck smiled on us, right? And the rich of today completely fulfill that truism. They lead the average person to think that the rich are no different than I am, right? And while this may inspire some people to work hard and save their money with the goal of eventually becoming rich themselves, it also has that effect of demystifying the aristocracy. There's no special quality about these people. There's nothing about them that's heroic or divine. The elite of today are mostly just some elite's kids who had connections, right? The law defends their wealth, and the corporate empires that they have defend their wealth. They don't have to defend it. I mean, it's like, again, they don't have to take up arms, right? The law does that for them. And to a large extent, you know, you, we look up to the rich and we see a bunch of playboys. They have no taste or education. When you listen to your average, average like, rich celebrity talk, right? like listen to an act, famous actor or a musician, they usually sound like morons. And so the more damning critique of the rich here, though, is this line, quote, possession alone differentiates you from them, end quote. So Nietzsche is saying to the rich of today, if Lady Luck turned her back on you, let's say completely unexpected disasters happen and, you know, the market tanks, your stocks crash, your companies. Um, you know, they're suddenly evaluated in the gutter, your savings is gone, and suddenly you find yourself destitute, right? Just as Americans can all be temporarily embarrassed millionaires, that you as a millionaire might just be a temporarily lucky uh, ho hobo, right? You never know, that might be your fate. And so suddenly you find yourself with no property, Nietzsche is saying, you would be a socialist just like the rest of them if that happened to you. And what proves this is that you're solely driven by the desire to possess. Since you have no higher calling, right, uh, than to chase your own hedonic desires, you would find yourself in the ranks of those who wish to possess but don't. And so the only way you can ward off the danger of socialism is by being truly better human beings. You have to aspire to some higher duty and learn how to sacrifice and renounce and project virtue. And I should note here that what Nietzsche is arguing is somewhat backed up by historical analysis, both in the work of Ibn Khaldun and in the work of Peter Turchin.
Nietzsche mentions, for example, quote, your houses, dresses, carriages, shops, the demand of your palettes and your tables, your noisy, operatic, and musical enthusiasm, end quote. He says that these things establish pleasure in the rich person because it's a form of contrasting themselves with the poor. It's actually very insightful because this is a pattern that we see evidence for as economic inequality accelerates in a given system, and especially as elite overproduction occurs. To explain what elite overproduction is as straightforwardly as I can, in every society there are a limited number of elite positions. They always have to be limited because their exclusivity is what makes them elite positions to some extent, right? So if we look back to ancient China, they had the ministerial exams at Chang'an, you know, and the children of rich, rich uh, landholders would go and study for these exams. They would undergo them in order to become one of the ministers and to enter into that hierarchy of elites. That was the route to power and influence. But it was limited by the exams and by their design that not everyone could pass them. I mean, that's exactly the same with our own university accreditation system of today. You have to reject a certain percentage of candidates. You have to fail a certain number of students, or else the university loses its prestige. We might consider titles of nobility in the uh, feudal systems, right? There are only so many lands, only so many ways that the land can be divided up. And while occasionally you can split up a plot of land or merge them and borders get shifted through warfare and so on and so forth... There's a limited number of titles you can award that can advance someone into or upwards through the patriciate. In our society today, those elite positions might be doctors, lawyers, a job at a large financial institution, or the upper echelons of the federal government, right? To get into any of these firms or institutions, you always need extensive schooling or really extensive credentials, right? But the schooling to get those credentials is expensive, and the number of people who can obtain a degree from a top educational inst institution is always limited. One of the ways you can measure the degree of wealth inequality in America is looking at how affordable a college like Yale is re relative to the real wages of a blue-collar worker, like, say, a manufacturing worker. And what we find is, as inequality in society accelerates, Going to Yale or going to medical school or any something, some prestige institution like that becomes prohibitively more expensive. So if you express the tuition needed to go to Yale in terms of what percentage of your annual wages you need to make as a manufacturing worker uh, or what you would need to pay as a, a, as a percentage of your annual wages, you'd see that today you need roughly 70% of what you make in a year to send your kid to Yale for one semester, for example, right? So... That's far higher than it's been in the past. For example, in 1960, you could send your kid to Yale for a semester for a third of your annual salary. Still very expensive, right, from that, uh, that kind of material position, but it's, you know, um, almost twice, it's more than twice as much uh, more prohibitive now in terms of the number of people that it just prices out of being able to advance, and so to explain this, what's actually happening is that as inequality continues to increase, more people are pushed down into the proletariat, but also more people ascend upwards into the patriciate. There's that uh, truism or aphorism, a rising tide lifts all boats, but which is true, but that doesn't actually smooth the inequality. It heightens it. Uh, if you're already at a higher level, you get lifted even faster. And there are, again, sort of structural economic reasons for this, such as the Peter Principle, which I've sort of made reference to. And arguing for that, I think, in any detail would take us a little too far afield. Um, but this has been measured, right? You know, as the patriciate expands, eventually you hit a point where there are more aspirant elites jockeying for a position than there are open positions within the elite. This happens because the elite, the amount of total amount of wealth in society is expanding, but um, the elite is always trying to limit the number of people who can get in. And so more and more aspirant elites don't make it, and they become what's called counter elites. Now, to return to Nietzsche, the phenomenon that Nietzsche is describing here is that among the class of the rich, their spending becomes more ostentatious, and they have all of these ways of expressing that they're part of the higher upper class culture. Why does this happen? Well, because it's one way of socially limiting the patriciate. 
As more and more people become 10 millionaires or 100 millionaires, the only way for you as a billionaire to distinguish yourself from them is to outspend them. Begin to display your wealth in such a way that no 100 millionaire could ever do it, right? Buy, distinguish yourself from them, right? Buy a bigger yacht. And so Nietzsche also quite rightly says of this type of ostentatious wealth display, quote, these are the things that spread the poison of that national disease, end quote. Insofar as these accelerating displays of extravagant wealth erodes social capital, that is a judgment that Ibn Khaldun makes, it creates that perception that there are two competing societies that Socrates talks about. The counter elite are able to point to all these ostentatious examples of spending to, um, you know, anger the proletariat. And while, you know, in past ages, the gentleman historians always sort of saw this as rabble rousing, we might note that during the process of accelerating inequality, that also means a lot of people are being going to be pushed down or at least shut out. They're going to feel a sense of pr precarity, right, as the middle is sort of hollowed out. And so, again, Nietzsche is not treating socialism, therefore, as a justified or good thing that he supports happening. In fact, it's what he's using as the harms of capitalism to argue against it. And so understand that socialism here is seen as the inevitable result of capitalism, that this is a necessary end that happens when capitalism begins to take root in a society. It's kind of the same thing Marx said yet again, the difference being that whereas Marx said, okay, let's bring the revolution forth. Nietzsche is saying, this is the death of society. Because in Nietzsche's view, it's, it's apocalyptic, right? But again, we have to understand, he is still sourcing the, if we're going to place responsibility on anyone, it's the lack of self-discipline of the rich that causes it. That's where it all begins. That's what generates that resentment, right? And so to repeat his words, his call to virtue to them, quote, if you wish to conquer the assailants of your prosperity, you must first conquer yourselves, end quote. Now, these considerations lead into Nietzsche's argument in the passage entitled Danger and Wealth, which appears in Human All to Human, book two, aphorism number 310, quote, danger and wealth, only a man of spirit should hold property, otherwise property is a public danger. For the owner, not knowing how to make use of the leisure which his possessions might secure to him, will continue to strive after more property. This strife will be his occupation, his strategy in the war with ennui. Such wealth, then, is the glittering outcrop of intellectual dependence and poverty. But it looks quite different from what its humble origin might lead one to expect, because it can mask itself with culture and art. It can, in fact, purchase the mask. By this means, they arouse envy in the poorer and the uncultivated, who at bottom are envious of culture and fail to recognize the masks as masks and gradually prepare a social revolution. For gilded vulgarity and histrionic self-inflation in a supposed enjoyment of culture instill into the latter the idea it is only a matter of money, whereas while it is to some extent a matter of money, it is much more a matter of spirit. End quote. Now, a word on the phrasing, a man of spirit or a matter of spirit. In German, this word implies just as much the soul as it does the intellect, such that you could read it as only a man of intellect should hold property, or it's to some extent a matter of money, but it is much more a matter of intellect. But intellect, unfortunately, has its limitations, just as the term spirit does. It's one-sided. It only includes the cognition leaving aside the sense in which we might say someone is spirited. Now, there's an element Nietzsche is describing, which we might call in English a state of mind or, or like an aspect of one's will power or something like that. So property or wealth or luxuria, whatever we call it, ultimately what it represents is power. And so we're allowing power to be dispersed among people with no willpower or no great intelligence, no great spiritedness. And that's ill-advised. Capitalism, as we've discussed, it doesn't ensure that the people who make great sums of money will necessarily be intelligent or spirited. So with this more complete picture of what Nietzsche has in mind, 
that the person who holds property should be both educated, but also possess the willpower to act and behave morally. He tells us what a man lacking in this quality will do with property once he attains it. He will simply use it to acquire more property. That will be his war with ennui, right, as Nietzsche calls it. Ennui is the sort of French existential form of boredom, the confrontation with the meaninglessness of existence in those moments where there is nothing to do. So without a sense of the higher calling, right, something to sacrifice yourself for or sacrifice your resources for, um, the modern man can simply, quote, purchase the mask. They can adorn themselves with the artifacts of culture. And because this is see-through, the populace at large will say to themselves, oh, being cultured is simply a matter of money. High culture is something I can purchase. Nietzsche says this in Schopenhauer as educator as well. He says not to mistake the uh, these four types for the ideal. He says the businessman, the worshiper of the state, the person who's obsessed with the outward forms of culture like etiquette, and then the intellectuals within you know the academy. Uh, these are not, these should not, none of those four should be used as our ideal. The man of outward culture, of etiquette, of current fashions and popular art as a status symbol, right? He seems to us rather see-through see because everyone knows that this person displays culture in a way that can just be purchased with money. And so I can also buy a tailored suit. I can purchase a ticket to the opera. I can purchase fine art for my foyer, right? That's what the higher culture now appears to be, something you can just buy your way into. And so it's no longer appears as something mysterious. It's no longer something superior. Um, okay, so now we'll look at some of the political writings on this topic found in Wanderer and His Shadow, Book 3 of Human Alter Human. Nietzsche is critical of democracy, he's critical of egalitarianism, but if we remember from his comments in the section A Glance at the State, he sees these forces as irresistible, and he sees at least some benefit insofar as it's creating, perhaps even inadvertently, this new pan-European culture. That's made possible for the new European man, the good European, rather than simply a good Frenchman or a good Englishman or a good German. And so he writes in Aphorism 275 of that text, quote, The democratization of Europe is a resistless force. Even he who would stem the tide uses those very means that democratic thought first put into men's hands, and he makes these means more handy and workable. The most inveterate enemies of democracy... I mean, the spirits of upheaval, seem only to exist in order by the fear they inspire to drive forward the different parties faster and faster on the democratic course. Now we may well feel sorry for those who are working consciously and honorably for this future. There is something dreary and monotonous in their faces, and the gray dust seems to have been wafted into their very brains. Nevertheless, posterity may possibly someday laugh at our anxiety and see in the democratic work of several generations what we see in the building of stone dams and walls, an activity that necessarily covers clothes and faces with a great deal of dust, and perhaps unavoidably makes the workmen too a little dull-witted. But who would, on that account, desire such work undone? It seems that the democratization of Europe is a link in the chain of those mighty prophylactic principles which are the thought of the modern era, and whereby we rise up in revolt against the Middle Ages. Now and only now is the age of Cyclopean building, a final security in the foundations, that the future may build on them without danger, henceforth an impossibility of the orchards of culture being once more destroyed overnight by wild, senseless mountain torrents, Dams and walls against barbarians, against plagues, against physical and spiritual serfdom. End quote. So, um, democracy, again, here treated in more concilia conciliatory notes as a spiritual rebellion against the world feeling of the Middle Ages, against that sense of serfdom and bondage. And sort of breaking down those provincial ties of land into a grander pro project that is self-consciously aimed at science, art, and culture. Um, the way this passage ties in with the critique of capitalism is in Nietzsche's argument that democracy has placed us into this age of cyclopean building, 
It's a time allowing for the construction of great projects, great collective projects. That's what's being made possible by the democratization of Europe. We might think of the great pyramids of Giza, the Roman Pantheon, the Notre Dame Cathedral, these great artistic expressions rendered in huge, imposing stone, which represented the collective power of a given age. That it's a living, not living, but a still standing monument to their asabia, right? The democratization of Europe here is considered as unstoppable, and it's been the driving force of this pan-European project that has the possibility of preserving European civilization in the analogical way of erecting walls of culture, right? So it could be protected as never before from barbarism, invasion, and plague. And Nietzsche, therefore, sort of is taking that principle from Machiavelli again, that it is permanence that gives the opportunity for political greatness, and so that should be the ultimate goal of the political project. He also expresses that idea in the Greek state, that the value of the state is just insofar as it preserves culture from destruction that it prevents the will from discharging itself in such a destructive, you know, lightning flash that creates these wildfires that swallow up culture, you know, by creating things like the the Greek Aegon and the competition within in a way that's not a war of annihilation, but just a war of competition between friends and rivals. Right? It's a it's all a means of creating culture in a way that it doesn't just get destroyed so that there's no ultimate lasting meaning from it. And it's notable here that Nietzsche makes perhaps the strange remark that democracy is, quote, a thing to come. He says it's a longstanding project, which is not itself even the goal. As to what the goal is, he suggests it at the end of this passage. He says, quote, after all, no one yet sees the gardener and the fruit for whose sake the fence exists, end quote. So the fence, it's the walls, the dams different ways of talking about this sort of enclosure of culture that can happen. But interpreting Nietzsche through his other statements, the fruit seems to be those productions of culture. We can't see what fruit this new pan-European culture will bear because it's, you know, hundreds of years in the making, right? Uh, you, You have to sort of turn your eye to the long game when you're looking to the creation of a space for genius to flourish and mutually incite and entice one another. That's the point of the polity for Nietzsche. And so creating this European suprastate, this transcendence of the nationalistic goals and the creation of a great unified civilization, it creates these opportunities for the greatest, most large-scale fruits of genius that have ever been possible on Earth, right? That's our own period of Cyclopean building, analogous to that of the Egyptians, where we can produce our equivalent of the Great Pyramids, that people still go marvel at the Great Pyramids today, and that society's been dead for thousands of years. What I'd like to call to mind here are Nietzsche's comments that only a man with children should have a share in the political franchise. We have to turn our attention to the long term, to the legacy that will be left behind in hundreds or in thousands of years for our political impact to really have any lasting meaning. That one should distrust the person of short-term goals or the person whose only concerns are with their own lives and their own fleeting pleasures. But that is exactly what capitalism attempts to turn our attention towards. In 286, Nietzsche writes that our liberalized market incentivizes those who, quote, only consider the moment and exploit the immediate opportunity, end quote. Um, A good ruler, he says, will, quote, look to the permanence of all conditions and thus also keep in view the well-being of the worker, his physical and spiritual contentment, end quote. So bring the worker in to this vast project of Cyclopean building as a partner, so to speak. But we might note that required for this, you know, this grand, this understanding of society that Nietzsche is promoting to actually be realized, we would have to introduce some competing value, some value in our economic considerations, which is set against capital efficiency. It doesn't makes sense within that one value of capital efficiency, efficiency in desire satisfaction, to have these long-term goals or to maintain the spiritual contentment of the worker. That just, uh, that doesn't make any sense from if you're purely operating on that value. And that's not 
because Nietzsche necessarily has great compassion for the workers. It's because healthy, committed workers, they're the very people that are needed for building those great dams and walls of culture. Um, and so the laborer has to be treated well, as he writes again in Wanderer 286, quote, in order that he and his posterity may work well for our posterity and become trustworthy for longer periods than the individual span of human life, end quote. So by turning our attention to a grand European project of culture, Nietzsche is giving us an alternative value um, and thus an alternative direction towards which we could harness the energies of liberal liberalization and democracy um, just as one harnesses steam for production or transportation. Um, and so he writes about this in Wanderer 292, quote, all political powers today, nowadays, attempt to exploit the fear of socialism for their own strengthening. Yet in the long run, democracy alone gains the advantage, for all parties are now compelled to flatter the masses and grant them facilities and liberties of all kinds, with the result that the masses finally become omnipotent. The masses are, as far as possible, removed from socialism as a doctrine of altering the acquisition of property. If once they get the steering wheel into their hands, through great majorities in their parliaments, they will attack with progressive taxation the whole dominant system of capitalists, merchants, and financiers, and will in fact slowly create a middle class which may forget socialism like a disease that has been overcome. End quote. So, it's, this is a very fascinating passage, because he begins with this idea of um, how socialism is being used by all the different parties for their own strengthening. Um, and I think this means not only in the sense of democratic principles being able to easily appeal to socialist principles in order to curry votes, but also in the sense that he talks about that, uh, you know, do anarchists harm princes, right? That uh, maxim in Twilight of Idols. Well, he says... Um, they actually help princes insofar as the prince has to be shot at in order to secure his authority on the throne, right? Him being shot at justifies his superiority, right? Um, and so, um, you know, Nietzsche's drawing an analogy that we immoralists, are we harming morality? Well, the moral of the story is perhaps that morality itself needs to be shot at, but kind of a tangent for, from what we're on here. The same way he's thinking that the socialists, the anarchists, all these people who are wanting to sort of attack the hierarchical structure of society are even useful to the people who oppose those goals, who can then use the socialists as like a boogeyman to rile up their own voters in order to go vote against the socialists. So, but it's also fascinating because he seems to sort of waver on his idea of socialism as this inevitable cataclysm because he's suggesting that perhaps because of the power of democracy, we don't actually need to worry about socialism in the long run being this thing that brings down society because it will be overcome and absorbed by the welfare state within liberal democracy. That once the socialists take power, uh, they'll be able to implement democratic uh, you know, measures to simply attack the capitalists and take their wealth through means like progressive taxation. And that that will become feasible uh, f you know, far, far before overthrowing the government becomes feasible, that these socialists in government will just become part of the establishment then and seek to preserve it. And historically speaking, it seems that Nietzsche was fairly prescient about this because FDR successfully diffused the socialistic uprising that seemed almost destined to occur in America if you were looking at how its history was playing out in the 1920s. FDR comes along and implements this robust welfare program um, and the social democracies of Northern Europe did much the same thing. We might consider that period after FDR and the decades leading up to the 70s and 80s where the labor unions in the United States became rather powerful. I mean, that started to reverse in the 70s, but part of that is perhaps because all of those developments had that effect of actually diffusing the socialist energy and therefore making socialism no longer a threat, functionally speaking. Nietzsche continues in this section, quote, the practical result of this increasing democratization will be a European League of Nations, in which each individual nation, delimited by the proper geographical frontiers, has the position of a canton with its separate rights, end quote. 
So another correct prediction about the future of politics from a continental philosopher, right? Nietzsche predicts the European Union in much the same way that Kant does. And when he brings up the example of a canton, he's undoubtedly thinking of the cantons of Switzerland. Nietzsche spent his summers there. He's somewhat familiar with their system, right? The cantons are like U.S. states. They're autonomous on many matters. And they might even have different languages and cultures from one another. You know, there's four official languages in Switzerland, uh, although I don't think Romansh is really spoken except by like very few people who are like really extremely rural. But, you know, ultimately there's sort of, there's a great deal of diversity of culture and language and even belief. So Switzerland is sort of uh, has Catholics and Protestants and Calvinists, right? Um, but ultimately all of these, for whatever regional or local autonomy they have, they're subsumed under the power of Switzerland as a nation state. So he's predicting this transnational Europe, that the conflicts of the future, he says, will not be the task of generals, but rather, quote, the task of future diplomats who will have to be at the same time students of civilization, agriculturalists, and commercial experts with no armies but motives and utilities at their back, end quote. So Nietzsche sees the potential in democracy while critiquing it, and he understands the root causes of socialism as contained in capitalism itself, while still warning of its fatal dangers. Because Nietzsche believes war is essential for mankind, the peace created by this new European transnational state will have to represent something very different from Kant's perpetual peace, however. And at many times throughout his writings, and even here, Nietzsche wonders about the potential for a struggle with Russia as a means of invigorating Europe, which is, again, oddly prescient given how the 20th century played out and how this is even recurring again today after you know, decades in which the Cold War seemed to be over. The theme, which is informative yet again, is that of the capitalist mindset as bringing on the socialistic heartage. Because the capitalist holds the market to be this purely voluntarist thing and solely driven by the industriousness and intelligence and resourcefulness of the people acting within it, um, it blinds him to the fact that the property question, and especially the origins of the property distribution, have always had a problem in their model. Because if property as it is distributed now is a direct result of how property was unjustly divvied up in the past, which the origins of property, how could anyone deny? It was means of by means of conquest and enslavement and domination and so on. And so that means that property, as it is divided up now, is still unjustly distributed insofar as the way those relations affect the distribution of property to some extent today, because people inherit things, right? And since there's no fundamental difference between our elite and common person uh, in a moral sense or in a spiritual sense, which is the conception of them that the rich themselves are responsible for fostering, then that means that there's an underlying logic within liberal democracy for redistributing the wealth and ameliorating this original injustice. So, of course, the eternal question is how to address that and how to ameliorate it. And since we're ameliorating the injustices of people long dead and punishing and rewarding the living in their stead, won't this create further injustice? And so Nietzsche discusses these complications in Wanderer and His Shadow 292. Quote, When the injustice of property is strongly felt, and the hand of the great clock is once more at this place, we formulate two methods of relieving this injustice, either an equal distribution or an abolition of private possession and a return of state ownership. The latter method is especially clear to the hearts of our socialists, who are angry with that primitive Jew for saying, Thou shalt not steal. In their view, the Eighth Commandment should rather run, Thou shalt not possess. The former method was frequently tried in antiquity, always indeed on a small scale, and yet with poor success. From this failure, we, we too may learn. Equal plots of land is easily enough said, but how much bitterness is aroused by the necessary division and separation, by the loss of time-honored possessions, how much piety is wounded and sacrificed. We uproot the foundation of morality when we uproot boundary stones. For there never have been two really equal plots of land, and if there were, man's envy of his, of his neighbor would prevent him from believing 
and their equality, end quote. There's so much here. Um, for one, the hand of the great clock is once more at this place. We have to always contextualize these passages within Nietzsche's understanding of history as somewhat cyclical and inevitable, even though there are ways which we can see he's clearly trying to figure out how through reason we might avoid the clock from coming back to that position again, right? But he sees that this has happened so many times in the ancient world. He references it here. The idea of thou shalt not steal being made equivalent to thou shalt not possess, we might think of the saying property is theft, right? That's how the socialists have interpreted the property question by uh, interpreting property as essentially theft. But Nietzsche, notice he doesn't really attack that any of those ideas. He simply attacks it on the matter of practicality. Um, it's another way in which Nietzsche criticizes both capitalism and socialism, actually, in a way reminiscent of some of his attacks on both free will and determinism, because they're both reflections of the same underlying mode of thought, which is utilitarianism, rendered into a political form and... You could just say that socialism is the further progression of utilitarianism that is necessarily contained within the premises that capitalism operates upon. So his solution for capitalism can never be socialism, right? That's why he, he is going against it here. Because it, it can't be socialism not just because he thinks it's a bad thing, but it doesn't make sense to call it the solution to the problem of capitalism, that if you're thinking about it in that sense, it's almost the wrong way to think about it because socialism is a function and an outgrowth of capitalism. It, it is implied by it, right? So we could also recall his metaphysical critique in section one of Human All Too Human, where he calls it a falsification of the world to equate unequal things. Well, Nietzsche questions the ability of capital to do that, to equate unequal things which is what capital has to do, or at least we must accept that it does this in order for the market to function. This is because capital, that's the quantity that's measured in the price of a good. The market puts a price on everything, a quantity. And then within this universal measure, you can say that 20 Big Macs is equivalent to one copy of the new Sports Illustrated magazine, and this car is one-fifth the value of that house, and so on and so forth. But none of these things is actually quote-unquote equal, and land is a great example. Um, people have ties to their land. The land has sentimental value. And this problem is exacerbated when we go back to ancient Greece, where they have this sort of religious tie to the land. But, I mean, imagine, I mean, that's those sort of ancestral or religious ties to land, we can't just kind of hand wave that away with, a, like, a socialist solution, because... Look at Israel and Palestine. Um, you know, that's like a long standing religious dispute over who owns uh, a, these lands that have deep religious value. But even just, you know, the territorial dispute between Armenia and Azerbaijan, where they fought like a little war over it, um, I think they're still technically fighting over it, right? And this land, from all accounts, I mean, it's not really that valuable. It's, it's the sentimental value, right? Um, so in any case, uh, you know, the, no piece of land is exactly the same as any other, just even on a practical level, any plot of land is going to have countless little differences from any one that you compare it to, even if they're right next to each other, you know, in the contours of the earth and in the soil composition and what plants and animals live on it. And, um, you know, whether there's water underneath it, whether there's a river, whether there are hills, whether there's, you know, trees or woods whether there's oil underneath it, right? How to evaluate all that is going to change from person to person. And so this critique of capital's equating ability is why the socialist can't just redistribute the land and create justice. They've just added injustice to injustice because it's still based on this equation of unequal things. And since Nietzsche's thinking is so pragmatic here, he seems mostly concerned with what effect that will have on society how redistribution of hard capital will further erode the social capital. And he draws in the examples of the revolutions of antiquity as evidence for why. This never works, right? Now, furthermore, shy of implementing a command economy, we would see that the distribution of land, if made perfectly equal, would quickly become unequal. 
through the continuing iterations of the capitalist game of trading and buying, right? So if one is seeking socialism through, you know, if they're looking for a persistent end to the class war, total egalitarianism through land redistribution, it'll never work. Nietzsche writes, quote, in a few generations, by inheritance, here one plot would come to five owners, there five plots to one. Even supposing that men acquiesced in such abuses through the enactment of stern laws of inheritance, the same equal plots would indeed exist, but there would also be needy malcontents, owning nothing but dislike of their kinsmen and neighbors, and longing for a general upheaval. End quote. All of these considerations, I think, are why, by the way, and many socialists listening to this are probably yelling this aloud at, <laughs> at this point, that Marxism aimed at the abolition of property altogether and not its equal distribution. I think maybe what Nietzsche is saying here could maybe be seen as more of a response to how he would see the progressive taxation regime of the socialists realized through the democratic um, you know, process, how that could also go wrong, even though he does say that if they actually successfully implemented it, they could just forget socialism like a disease. Um, here he would seem to think that that's not possible. So again, here as in everywhere else in Nietzsche's political thought, we find contradictions. But he, he talks about the other option, quote, restore ownership to the community and make the individual but a temporary tenant, end quote. But he says that's equally untenable. Nietzsche doesn't really answer Marx here. However, he turns his attention to Plato, quote, when Plato declares that self-seeking would be removed with the abolition of property, we may answer him that if self-seeking be taken away, men will no longer possess the four cardinal virtues either, as we may say that the most deadly plague could not injure mankind so terribly as if vanity were one day to disappear. Without vanity and self-seeking, what are human virtues? By this, I am far from meaning that these virtues are but varied names and masks for these two qualities. Plato's utopian refrain, which is still sung by socialists, rests upon a deficient knowledge of men, end quote. And so the, the idea of envy, right, in Nietzsche's mind, it's a basic part of human nature, and we can't remove that element of contest and competition from human life. And the more the socialists attempt to stop it from emerging, the more it will manifest itself in the subtlest ways in other domains. We might draw, for example, in, uh, what we saw in the socialist command economies that were actually implemented in the 20th century. The Politburos didn't represent these pristine democratic institutions, either in China or in Russia, but became completely closed off patriciates, rife with paranoia and corruption. And they used the possessions of others rather flippantly because men always treat property that's not their own as rather cheap. And for the same reason, Nietzsche doesn't think people can simply be given property to solve the property question, because, quote, man is opposed to all that that is only a transitory possession, unblessed with his own care and sacrifice. With such property, he behaves in freebooter fashion, as robber or as worthless spendthrift, end quote. So Nietzsche has criticized capitalism throughout but he hasn't held back on socialism either, because as we've said, if he sees socialism as the inevitable and necessary end of capitalism, capitalism is bad, but it's because it's bad because the end it always drives at, which is socialism. And so in contrast to this, Nietzsche hasn't really given us an affirmative idea or a political program of his own when it comes to man's economic life. He's simply argued that capitalism as it stands now is, for one, a sort of degradation on what came before. It's an inferior way to create a hierarchy. But second, that the socialist answer to it is a cataclysm that can't be avoided, except by sort of forestalling with it or maybe bargaining with it. Or maybe per perhaps in some you know, points he seems to suggest maybe it'll merge with it and sort of allow the socialists into power whereby they will become the establishment. But in any of those cases capitalism in the laissez-faire sense always contains the seeds of its own destruction. And that's where Nietzsche's somewhat conciliatory remarks toward democracy become interesting in concert with these ideas. 
because he's similarly two-sided about democracy as this resistless force we have to accept and make our peace with, even learn to harness. But it's also like a degradation on the political system of yesteryear for its selection of mediocrity. But again, there might be positive ways to use democratic energy. And so here in this rather unusual passage, and I say this solely because it's unusual, solely because it came from the hand of Nietzsche, right? We have Nietzsche's proposed limitations or regulations on democracy in order to combat the danger caused by this corrupting effect of allowing men who succeeded within the capitalist selection mechanism to hold power or allowing the socialistic tendency to grow and grow and grow unchecked and then eventually overwhelm the state. This is in Wanderer and His Shadow 293. Quote, Democracy tries to create and guarantee independence for as many as possible in their opinions, way of life, and occupation. For this purpose, democracy must withhold the political suffrage, both from those who have nothing and from those who are really rich, as being the two intolerable classes of men. At the removal of these classes, it must always work, because they are continually calling its task into question. In the same way, democracy must prevent all measures that seem to aim at party organization. For the three great foes of independence in that threefold sense are the have-nots, the rich, and the parties. End quote. So this is a conditional imperative, right? It's not a categorical imperative. Nietzsche's not throwing his lot in with the Democrats wholesale. He's prescribing what Democrats should do if they want the democratic system to preserve itself in the long term. It has to recognize three dangers, the parties, the rich, and the poor. And you rarely get such free advice from Nietzsche. So any small d Democrats out there, listen closely. The reason why parties are a danger we discussed last time. They make everyone narrow, hedonistic, average in their values. They make communication and articulation of our principles stupid and simplistic. The obligation of the parties is to tailor their message to the most people. Um, and that means communicating to the lowest common denominator, which means disseminating stupidity into society. So you can have democracy, but if you want to preserve it, you have to limit the power of the parties or find ways to stop them from forming in the first place, or just exclude them, ban them, right? The founding fathers warned about the same thing, but alas, I don't think we found an effective means of running democracy without political parties, at least not yet. But here Nietzsche adds to the list of dangers, the rich, and the poor. And really by the rich, I don't think he's talking about your average millionaire. He means the halls of the elite, the super rich, the corporate chiefs, the people who really run society. His argument is as follows. Democratic systems of government, if they are to survive, have to expel these people because they're the destabilizing elements of the system. The elites, they're not any better than the average person in terms of their courage or their spirit. They're just hungry to acquire more wealth and they will use the state to get that. They're just following their desires. And the socialists are exactly like them. They're just coming from the other side. They're coming from a position of no power. Both are sort of a mirror image of one another. And they'll both attack the health of the community for their own personal gain. Nietzsche even goes farther here in terms of the regulations he would place on the economy. This is 285 of Wanderer and His Shadow. Quote, in order that property may henceforth inspire more confidence and become more moral, we should keep open all paths of work for small fortunes, but should prevent the effortless and sudden acquisition of wealth. Accordingly, we should take all the branches of transport and trade which favor the accumulation of large fortunes, especially therefore the money market, out of the hands of private persons or private companies, and look upon those who own too much just as upon those who own nothing, as types fraught with danger to the community. End quote. So if we want to preserve democracy, we should look upon the super rich, just as we look upon the destitute, as dangerous people. We should regard them with suspicion. I, and it's, you know, to say that we should regard both that way is somewhat radical, because if you think about it, people who tend to regard the super rich with suspicion typically view the poor with compassion, Whereas those on the right who might look to the super rich as role models might view the poor with suspicion, right? In Nietzsche's view, we need to see the danger in both and take legal steps to protect ourselves against both. A democratic society, if, if it wishes to endure, it has to 
maintain, it has to hold the center, right? Or it will be destabilized. Because in some sense, the weakness of liberal society is in the market. And in the liberalization of the market, and in the extreme swings in wealth and material advantage that can be unpredictable, and again, where there's no incentive towards things like societal unity or morality or you know anything like that. Now, the advantage of the market being liberalized is that it seems like a necessary step to distribute opportunity to make more freedom possible, right? But it's such a powerful selection mechanism for the very reason that what it's driven by is hedonistic pleasure, which people are so susceptible to. And its logic is so persuasive since most people, I mean, at least these days, most people act like utilitarians even if they don't know what the word utilitarianism means. But capital, as Nietzsche has shown, contains its own death drive. It's the negation of itself within it. It always leads to excesses, to the unmasking of its hierarchy as illegitimate, at least insofar as our own morality would regard it. But given the outsized power of the super rich, if they're not curbed, there's no way to reform it to make it legitimate. And if you trust the destitute masses, you know, the socialists, um, to just the spirits of upheaval, as Nietzsche calls them, to just um, put a shock to the system and try and tear down the whole thing, uh, that doesn't reform the system either, right? It just, it's just the swelling sentiment to tear it down. And so what does Nietzsche suggest? Well, for one, he says that we should nationalize the financial sector. That's what he's saying in so many words, which is really a radical idea. Make it illegal to suddenly acquire great wealth. Cut off all the avenues in which someone could come from very little to a great deal of money, which is basically all financial speculation. So, you know, abolish the stock market <laughs> or have the federal government just take control over it, you know, right? Perhaps even have some sort of test or gauntlet someone has to be passed to be qualified to become a wealthy person, right? Um perhaps some sort of expectation that they act as a public servant to some extent, maybe something like that, a social or legal obligation. These would all be actually wonderful ideas, I think. Um, I think some of them would, might actually wreck society faster than a socialistic revolution, <laughs> like abolishing the stock market, but I, I still think it should be tried. Um, Nietzsche then goes on to make some fascinating comments about the value of labor, which is also defiant against Marxist analysis as much as it is against the considerations of, say, an Adam Smith type person who thinks capitalism will, you know, if implemented reasonably and fairly, will necessarily improve human well-being. So Nietzsche writes in Wanderer 286, quote, if we try to determine the value of labor by the amount of time, industry, good or bad will, constraint, inventiveness or laziness, honesty or make-believe bestowed upon it, the valuation can never be a just one. For the whole personality would have to be thrown on the scale, and this is impossible. Here the motto is, judge not. But after all, the cry for justice is the cry we now hear from those who are dissatisfied with the present valuation of labor. If we reflect further, we find every person non-responsible for his product, the labor. Hence, merit can never be derived therefrom. And every labor is as good or as bad as it must be through this or that necessary concatenation of forces and weaknesses, abilities and desires. The worker is not at liberty to say whether he shall work or not, or to decide how he shall work. Only the standpoints of usefulness, wider and narrower, have created the valuation of labor. End quote. So every person is non-responsible for his product, the labor. That might be a puzzling remark, but it makes sense in light of Nietzsche's rejection of free will, which begins here in Human All Too Human. Nietzsche can take such a dispassionate approach to these issues because he doesn't see anyone as morally responsible for whatever good or ill they do in society. All of our actions are fated. All of our actions are necessary. They flow out of who and what we are. And so the, the laborer is not responsible for how industrious or lazy or how conscientious or inattentive he is. These are aspects of his own nature, which he did not choose, right? He didn't choose his nature. And thus the meritocracy doesn't actually select for merit in the moral sense. Um, it's, we might say it's still laudable or admirable because somebody, you know, contributed more, but they didn't really have a choice as to how productive they are. Uh, it might still make sense to select for people of greater merit uh, 
um, but just as means of a practical incentive structure, right? But it's not actually a moral reflection of them as people. It doesn't actually indicate that they quote unquote deserve anything. And so Nietzsche says that the market incentives, what he calls here the standpoints of usefulness, or we might say utility, determine the value of labor, what the market is willing to pay based on what the average person is willing to pay to satisfy a given desire. The state of affairs can also, uh, as it unfolds, seem more industrious small business owners. You know, they could lose to an undisciplined and unintelligent business owner who simply begins with far more capital in the competition, right? Or the factory worker could lose out to automation because there's no reason why the thing producing the product needs to be a human being. The value of labor can't be thought of as a reward for one's hard work, therefore. It's merely a transaction that rewards how valuable one is at satisfying desires to the owner of the means of productions, right? How valuable are you to the guy who owns the machine or you're working? If, and if a machine can do it better without a person at all, he'll always pick the machine and he'll do so exactly at the point at which it becomes cheaper to maintain the machine than to pay a worker. A great example of this is actually the example of horses, which we used to ride and have pull all our carriages. Horses used to be an integral part of human economies for thousands of years, and they didn't decline in importance uh, you know, over the centuries of technological advancement, they became even more important as a lot of that technology allowed the population to swell, medical science to advance, and transport became more global, horses became all the more important. And the horse population in the world became huge. And to look particularly at America, um, you know, they were using them economically as transport, trade, incredibly valuable, and then the horseless carriage comes in, and whoops, the horse is no longer so valuable. And this took time, right? It was a process. A lot of people use the analogy of buggy whips, right? They're like, oh, we don't need to worry about automation just because the guy who makes buggy whips no longer, you know, that he's out of business. But we often forget that this also included, as part of this process, a huge reduction in the population of horses because we just didn't need as many of them. We only began to, you know, do horse riding as a sort of like legacy activity, it's now it's just a sport, right? And that's not because the horses got worse at their job. There was just there was a machine that came along that could do it better. And so the economy doesn't select for the health of horses. But maybe that insight should lead us to the understanding that it doesn't select for the health of humans either. So at no point in this selection process does virtue, hard work, or industriousness actually enter into the value of labor. Labor is only valuable insofar as what it can produce. Nietzsche takes this out of a moral consideration as to like whether the person deserves it or not. And as such, who succeeds and fails in the business world? I mean, it's anyone will tell you there's an element of randomness here, but Nietzsche is even saying that in the element of whether or not you're an effective worker or whether you're an effective businessman or whatever it may be, not even that is like a product of your own free will. And so he's taking away that moral justification for the system in, in at least one sense in this passage. Nietzsche goes on to suggest one way in which these incentives of the market will lead to an overall decline in the quality of goods. This is related to the increased importance of appearance in a market economy. This is 280. Quote, in the competition of production and sale, the public is made judge of the product, but the public has no special knowledge and judges by the appearance of the wares. In consequence, the art of appearance, and perhaps the taste for it, must increase under the dominance of competition, while, on the other hand, the quality of every product must deteriorate, end quote. From this, we get another affirmative suggestion that Nietzsche offers that's not a whole political program, but just sort of one policy prescription he offers. We could compare the approach that he is about to give to the guild systems of the Middle Ages in Europe perhaps something that could return through maybe a new period of unionization. Nietzsche argues for, quote, masters of the craft, end quote, to be the only judges of the quality of a product. And that accordingly, we can't just let anyone produce what they want and let the public decide whether it's a good product because the public isn't qualified to decide. He continues in this passage, quote, only the master of the craft should pronounce a verdict on the work and the public should be dependent on the belief and the personality of the judge and his honesty. Accordingly, no anonymous work, end quote. And so 
It's funny, Nietzsche doesn't talk about abolishing property or the market economy. Where he's attacking the system, first of all, is in its financialization. So the big holders of capital who steer the economy without producing anything themselves, only by providing funding, by speculating, and so on. And here he attacks the system insofar as mass production of goods opens the way to goods of low quality and to frauds and hucksters and people who will acquire great wealth while cheating their customers. And so everyone will then suffer from the inferior workmanship. That it's another way in which, so the liberalization of the press leads to an overall averageness and mediocrity and decline in information and the quality of communication and knowledge. Here, uh, workmanship and the quality of goods suffers from that same process, right? It's basically... Again, because of the fact that the public at large is not a very good judge of quality, and so the quality will inherently go down. Our desires will... I mean, think about it like this, right? Um, I'll go to fast food again, right? McDonald's, Taco Bell, Subway. These are the most successful, quote-unquote, restaurant franchises in the country. But you could argue that quality-wise, it's not like... McDonald's tastes bad, right? Obviously it doesn't. It obviously tastes very good and palatable to a lot of people. But in terms of like what your actual taste experience is and the textures and the flavor profile, like everyone knows like this is mass produced and cheap and it's like very like crude. Your experience with like the food and the flavor and what it does for you, it's just sort of crude, tasty calories. Um it's very different experience to have like a home cooked meal, right? I'm not even talking about like some like rich five course gourmet meal. I just mean like a home cooked meal where you're not like overloaded with salt and butter and sugar and everything. You can actually like taste the individual ingredients, right? That not a very high standard. Um, but that's what our capitalist system has selected for. Like the top of the restaurant game, right? Is we see what comes to the top, what the most popular food that appeals to the most common denominator is. So it's like even in terms of, and you could apply that. You say you could say the same thing applies to quality of goods, right? Where do people do, buy most of their retail shopping from big box store chains, right? And it's not always like low quality, but again, it's the most sort of like average, mediocre goods. And it's not like they're high quality either, right? Um, okay, so then Nietzsche even goes so far as to sort of attack early industrial attempts at automation here, which is very interesting. He says, quote, The cheapness of an article is for the layman another kind of illusion and deceit, since only durability can decide that a thing is cheap and to what an extent. But it is difficult and for a layman impossible to judge of its durability. Hence that which produces an effect on the eye and costs little at present gains the advantage, this being naturally machine-made work. Again, machinery, that is to say the cause of the greatest rapidity in facility and production, favors the most saleable kind of article. Otherwise it involves no tangible profit and would be too little used and too often stand idle. End quote. So again, the pattern in Nietzsche's thought. Most successful political party appeals to most people. Most successful saleable good appeals to the most customers. Mass production rather than specialized workmanship is where the market will inevitably turn, which means it will turn away from quality and towards quantity, toward, from specialization to automation, which is necessary because these means of production, these machines are expensive. They can't just sit there and take up space. So we have a counter incentive against any specialization or deviation from the mass produced article. And though the system that rewards the satisfaction of the most desires of the most people is rather successful at that in some sense, what we get is the most mediocre, most average sense of satisfaction, right? And um, the quality of goods as tied to, like, I guess what Nietzsche is talking about, because he says there are ways of improving property and making it more moral, right? And so in a, in a sense, he's appealing to our sense for, um, making someone's merit in their industriousness or their skill as a craft craftsman more directly tied to the profit that they actually make that, you know, he's pointing out in so many words, nothing about the economy actually correlates hard work with the amount of capital that you can amass. <laughs>
that um, it might appear to play out that way relative to like, you know, you might look around in your office and it seems like all these people who exist on this relatively the same level of work to capital, like input and output, right? Um, it might seem like work correlates with um, how much capital you'll, you're able to amass, but you're just comparing yourselves to people who are all relatively in the same category. You're not considering yourself relative to the entirety of the economy, in which case, if you look at the entire financial sector and you look at like every economic actor going on, you would find that uh, hard work does not directly correspond to economic success. I mean, a great example of this, for example, would be people who go take a job like um, uh, or who enlist in the military, right? The military doesn't make a lot of money. It's like, you're, are you going to say that's not hard work? Um, obviously, it's hard work, right? So, you know, and, and indeed, some of the hardest jobs are, you know, they're not necessarily the most well-paying. Now, you could say to some extent it selects for it, but I don't know. I think when we look at the whole economy, it that that idea that these things are somehow correlated like stops making sense the more comprehensive your view is, which means it's not a really good principle. And so in any case, what happens is the laborer's value falls. He becomes an interchangeable commodity rather than an individual craftsman with his own skills and characteristics. And such people just simply can't compete against the mass-produced, mass-distributed goods, at least as a general rule. And so the market incentives push you to conglomerate, to act in the form of these giant corporations, or else be absorbed into them. Perhaps the most anti-capitalist note, or the most stringent anti-capitalist note that Nietzsche sounds throughout is in Wanderer 286, where he writes, quote, The exploitation of the worker was, as we now understand, a piece of folly a robbery at the expense of the future, a jeopardization of society. We almost have the war now, and in any case, the expense of maintaining peace, of concluding treaties and winning confidence will henceforth be very great, because the folly of the exploiters was very great and long-lasting. End quote. Given all we've discussed, perhaps these surprising words from Nietzsche might be comprehensible to us. The robbery at the expense of the future is the short-term mindset of the capitalist system. And we all have this mindset because we haven't selected for noble individuals. Nobility of spirit, we might say, right? And with these people helming society, we get what we deserve. Unfortunately, in Nietzsche's time as in our own, those in power are not so much interested in curing the disease that causes socialism as they are in vilifying the symptoms. They hear the signal from the system that there's something wrong, and their response is to sort of yell at the signal. <laughs> and while in Nietzsche's time it was dynastic governments, in our own time we might consider the entrenched party structures, powerful media conglomerates, multinational corporations, big tech, big pharma, the permanent governance of intelligence agencies and bureaucracies, all the people with inherited wealth who have found themselves among the most powerful people in the world due to an accident of birth. Nietzsche argues that when these people worry the masses about the threat of socialism, it is only to their own advantage. And this is because for some section of the populace, that will drive them into arms. It'll work. Uh, they'll take up arms against socialism in hopes of being protected from their tiny little share of wealth in comparison being taken. And so Nietzsche writes in 316, quote, the socialistic movements are nowadays becoming more and more agreeable rather than terrifying to the dynastic governments because by these movements they are provided with a right and a weapon for making exceptional rules, and can thus attack their real bogies, Democrats and anti-dynasts. Towards all that such governments professedly detest, they feel a secret cordiality and inclination, but they are compelled to draw the veil over their soul. End quote. Sorry. So that's a tendency we recognize today, and it's not just with socialism, but any bogeyman movement among the populace, it becomes absorbed into that language of the political parties and represented in giant frescoes of stupidity, right? And just think about how that's always used, right? Um, during the Bush era, the threat of terrorism, incredibly useful for making exceptional rules. Um, in our own time, there's a lot of worry about like populism and like domestic terrorism and the Trumpers and QAnon people and stuff. But that allowed 
the Capitol Police to receive unprecedented funding and expanded powers. And, you know, this has happened throughout U.S. history. We could go back to the days of McCarthyism when it was quite literally socialism that allowed them to establish the House Un-American Activities Committee and ruin people and cancel them. You know, that was the one of the first cancelings was the Red Scare, right? Now, in conclusion, if we're to try and summarize what Nietzsche's problem with capitalism is, it's that it uplifts people into power via mechanisms of, in so many words, the slave morality. Capitalism prizes or rewards the intellectual power to do things like manipulate the law or the guile to call on authority to punish competitors for you via means of the legal system or the will to deception to misrepresent who and what you are to um, you know successfully craft your public image to successfully keep your corporate secrets. The capitalist power is also the power of the priest in some sense to promise to the common man that his own hinterland, his own heaven, lies in this very product, to redirect the consumer's will into the pursuit of hedonic pleasures, often with the idea that this will fundamentally reshape his life. And we could do a whole episode on advertising and how the first serious mass marketers were influenced by psychoanalysis, that the advertisers realize that in selling things to you, they're not attempting to persuade you logically. The goal isn't to inform you or to engage with you intellectually. It's to hook you on the level of your libido, the level of your impulses. And so in my own formulation, the great capitalist in our modern system is sort of the high priest of our utilitarianism. Because ultimately, it's the same value system, that of measuring pleasure and pain as the determinant of whether life is good or not. That lies beneath both capitalism and utilitarianism. And I know the capitalists don't want to hear that because they probably, and somewhat rightly, understand that utilitarianism is often a useful ideology for the left because you can justify any state intervention on the basis of utilitarianism. But in, ter in terms of just like reducing everything down to, to man's life just requiring pleasure, that's both the utilitarian moral landscape of a Sam Harris and the capitalist realism of a Steven Pinker. I don't know that either man is properly speaking left or right, but they're sort of, you know, I feel like Sam's sort of a little closer to the left and Pinker's a little closer to the right. They're both centrist sort of like reasonable sounding advocates for utilitarianism, albeit just in different language, right? And Pinker is a great example because his book, Enlightenment Now, essentially makes a utilitarian argument for why modern society um, modern society being liberal democracy with capitalism as its economic basis, that's all just fine because look at how comfortable and safe we are and how much pleasure we can have, how much pain we can avoid. Capitalism has done this for us. It just needs a modern welfare system to accompany it in order to sort of shore up at the edges, right? And that's the fuller expression of liberalism, of capitalism, of socialism that we're coming into today. Now, if hierarchy is inevitable, or if, at least for the moment, we can't get away from it, then we should at least be sure to select for the leaders of best possible character. And arguably, humanity has never really figured this out. But the recurrent theme of Nietzsche's work is not to attack the hierarchy itself, but to examine what it selects. If it selects for aspects that undermine power in the long term, your society will fall. It's only a matter of time. And so Nietzsche stands in contradiction to the traditions of anarchists and libertarians and objectivists who think that capitalism actually creates this rule by the best, that capitalism is a form of aristocracy. These passages make, should make it clear Nietzsche doesn't believe that. And so we shouldn't mistake Friedrich Nietzsche for Ayn Rand, someone to whom he's often compared or conflated. Nietzsche would in fact oppose Rand in many respects for her failure to see that individualism is not opposed to the state, but created by it. That capitalism overwhelms all individuals with the incentives that drive the masses to hedonism. And within this hedonistic value system, only the most craven and manipulative individuals manage to rise to the top. But they don't maintain their individuality purely within the capitalist model. I mean, far from it. They're still just driven by the pursuit of pleasure like everyone else. We all become pleasure-seeking machines. It requires some values outside of that in order to create what Nietzsche would consider to be, to be an actual individual, someone who you know, uh, is able to uh, 
produce or enter into the realm of culture, into the dialogue of culture, something along those lines. And so this is Nietzsche's most damning point to the super rich. The socialists are you. <laughs> and his most damning point to the socialists, you are the super rich. That's why the idea of a champagne socialist is not unheard of. Because the socialist on, the, on an individual level can often be found pursuing their own material advancement just as vigorously as everyone else. Nietzsche would also differ from, from uh, Ayn Rand in his view that the state is not a completely extraneous or unjust institution upon humans who would otherwise be free, or that the state should be as minimally um, applied to human life as possible, that there's some sort of contradiction between market and state whenever the state enters the economic realm. And of course, Ayn Rand would support the state insofar as it defends your freedom and liberty. That's really all the state is supposed to do is just create the space for the market to function. And whenever it interferes there in the market, that's unjust in some way, right? Um, but for Nietzsche, the state is the objectification of instinct. It's the creation of a naturally occurring hierarchy merely in the political sphere. And so he thinks the state actually has a purpose. It has a function beyond simply defending the individuals within it so they can do capitalism. He thinks that culture is real and that there's a social order that exists independently of any one person. And this makes society inexplicable as a mere collection of individuals. That the state serves a function beyond capitalism, beyond the acquisition of desire or material needs. That the market should only ever be a means, just as the state should only ever be a means. And so, what does Nietzsche offer instead for the state to do, for the state to create, for the state to defend, instead of capitalism? Well, for better or for worse, I think that is a question that Nietzsche mostly leaves to the philosophers of the future. Next week, we're going to talk about Nietzsche's views on socialism. And by now, it should be obvious why, why he would uh, sort of oppose socialism in many respects. Um, and But we're going to elaborate on that more next week. And so, yet again, it's very difficult to say with exactitude what Nietzsche was for politically, but we're going to continue next week in outlining what he was against. And so join me next time for Nietzsche Contra Socialism. Signing off. If you enjoyed the Nietzsche podcast or found it helpful, you can visit us and support the show at patreon.com slash untimely reflections. The link is in the description. Or just share the show with any of your friends that you think might enjoy it or on social media. Thank you for your support.